Okay, so in part two here of the lecture, we're going to pick up with the ambiguous case. What is the ambiguous case? Well, you may recall from high school geometry that there were ways that you would prove that one triangle was congruent to another triangle. Do you remember all those ways? Side angle side, side side side. What else? Angle side angle. These were the postulates. And then there was one which was a theorem because you could derive it from angle side angle, and that was angle angle side. So there were four different ones that you could use. But then there was also one that was totally prohibited. Do you remember which the prohibited one was? Angle side side. Hmm. Now fortunately it was very easy for high school students to remember why angle side side, well maybe not why, they didn't have to remember why it was prohibited, they just had to learn not to use it. Don't use this. And since it spells something, it was not very hard to remember not to use this one. The question is why was this one not allowed? Certainly not because of the fact that it spelled something. That was just a way to remember it. Instead, it's because it's the ambiguous case. The ambiguous case means that this information alone is not sufficient to create one unique triangle. Right here, all of these, these green ones, these are sufficient to make a unique triangle. And that's why just having this information alone would prove that two triangles are congruent. This is insufficient. So we're going to look at the ambiguous case now by looking at my open math questions 6 through 8. Okay, question number 6. We have uh, the measure of angle A is equal to 39 degrees. Little a is 22 and B is 65. I'm going to do this on the whiteboard. So here I am, I'm trying to draw this triangle. I've labeled angle A 39 degrees. And I've determined that this side will be side B. And it will be opposite angle B. The problem is, I'm having trouble figuring out where does angle B go? Should I put it over here or over there? Well, actually, Either is a possibility. This is the ambiguous case. So we have two possible locations for B. Now we need to label side A 22. Side A is opposite angle A. So this would be side A in the case of the obtuse triangle. And this is side A in the case of the acute triangle. Now, so that this is not so confusing, I'm going to redraw as two separate triangles. So I've taken this triangle diagram and I've split it into the obtuse case and the acute case. Now you can see very clearly that this is angle, side, side. Whenever you have angle, side, side, that's when you should have those red flags go up and say, oh my goodness, this is the ambiguous case. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw two separate diagrams, or if you're okay with having the combo diagram, the combo diagram is fine. Some people think better with separate diagrams. Some people are okay with a combo. Either way, what we're going to try to do is find the unknowns, right? So here we have a pair of a, a side opposite the angle, right? And what we don't have is angle B. So we need to hunt down angle B. So we'll go ahead and set up that 22 divided by the sine of 39 degrees is equal to 65 over the sine of B. Now this proportion I've just written matches both the obtuse situation and the acute situation. Both of them match this proportion. So now we're going to cross multiply, except I'm not going to do it all on my calculator because I have a missing B 
So now when I cross multiply, I'm going to have that the sine of B is equal to 65 times the sine of 39 divided by 22, right? I get this from cross multiplying. And then I need a decimal approximation for that. just happened here? Do you see why this is a problem? What is the range for sine? As sine oscillates up and down, the lowest it goes is negative 1 and the highest that it goes is positive 1. This value exceeds positive 1. What does that mean? That means that there is no such triangle that would have these side lengths and this angle. They do not exist. So the ambiguous case could not only possibly give you two different triangles, it could give you no triangle at all. So flip back now to my open math and you can see that all of these are D and E. Does not exist. If no answer exists, enter D and E for all answers in the column. Now, no matter how many times you do question number six, it's probably going to be a does not exist problem. But you need to figure out how to do these because on the quiz, look at the quiz, special for quiz 13, questions two through four are shuffled and may not line up with the order of numbers two through four from versions you've attempted of practice quiz 13. Likewise, questions number two through four are shuffled in the practice quiz. So what that means is that when I go to take this practice quiz, questions two, three, and four could be in any order. Questions two could be the one with do not exist. Oh, it's not. This is the one that has one unique triangle. This is the one that has does not exist. And then this one has two triangles. Okay, so the first one, one unique triangle. The second one does not exist. The third one, two unique triangles. But look, if I go back and I reset it, question two this time has two triangles. Question three this time is still does not exist. Uh, and question number four has the one unique triangle. All that to say is these triangles are going to get shuffled for questions two through four. So that means that every time you take the practice quiz 13, every new attempt, you're going to have a shuffling of these middle problems so that you won't know which one is the do not exist problem. Okay, so going back to the homework, I'm not sure why I just reset that, but anyway, question six was the do not exist problem, and it will be the same for you, but you still need to work through it so you can be prepared for it for the practice quiz, and consequently the real quiz. Okay, here we go now to question number seven. Question number seven is going to give us two triangles, so I'll go ahead and set that one up. In this problem, we have that angle B is given to us as 58 degrees. Side B is 49 and side C is 56. Okay, I've taken the same diagrams from before, but I've changed the variables and I've changed the numbers. So in this problem, we have that angle B is 58 degrees, side C is 56 degrees, sorry, 56. <laughs> uh, side B, which is the side opposite angle B, is 49. And I've, I've drawn both variants, the obtuse and the acute. Okay, so let's say you just draw your triangle like this and you start working. 
first of all, you draw it and you notice, oh, look, I have angle, side, side. I need to keep in mind that this could be the ambiguous case. If, in, as in the previous problem, you ended up with a number that exceeded 1 for a sign value or was lower than negative 1 for a sign value, either way, you would end up with a situation where there are no triangles. In this case, when I set up the proportion, let's see what happens. I have at the sine, I have 49 over the sine of 58 is equal to 56 over the sine of C. So now I cross multiply and I get that the sine of C is equal to 56 sine 58 over 49. And this value should be between negative 1 and 1, right? I get 0.9692 approximately. Okay, now on the unit circle, Point nine six nine two is pretty close to one. So we're going to have two dots that are very high up, one on either side. Of course, when I use sine inverse on my calculator, it will only give me the dot from the first quadrant. So let's get that. Sine inverse of this value, or using the answer button on the calculator, would help if I actually didn't erase everything. <laughs> okay, I can do this. So I get the value 75.74 degrees. That's the first quadrant angle. That angle right there is 75.74 degrees. Now, the angle over here on the other side has to be congruent. So to get the second dot, we're going to subtract 75.74 from 180. And so this other dot right here has the value of 104.26 degrees. Now, this represents angle C, right? We're trying to find angle C. This angle C is an obtuse angle, so it needs to go in my obtuse triangle. So this angle C is 104.26. That number right there. Right there, right? Okay, and then the acute angle goes in the acute triangle, 75.74. And then we just need to find uh, the missing angle A for each triangle by subtracting these two values from 180. So if we subtract 104.26 and 58, the last angle here is going to be 17.74 for angle A. And then over here, angle A, we take 180 and subtract 58 and 75.74, and we get 46.26. So that's how we're getting two different triangles. And then we just have one other thing missing, and that is side A. But just so that you're tracking with me, let's go back to my open math for a second. Here we had uh, finding angle C. We found out that one of the angle C's was 75.74, and the other angle C was 104.26. I rounded to the hundredths place. Then we found angle A that corresponded to each triangle based off its own diagram. 
Angle A was 46.26 from the acute triangle, and it was 17.74 in the obtuse triangle. So now to find side A, the side A values will be different, so we're going to need to have two different proportions. So going back to the board, I need to erase this right here so I can have some space. Let's first try to find little a in the acute. So to get little a, we say that little a over the sine of 46.26 degrees is equal to over sine of 58. Now at this point it may bother you that you're using the same variable in a problem to mean two different things. That would bother me. So it's often helpful to give each of these values subscripts. So for your acute values you could say that I have C sub 1, B sub 1, a sub 1, little a sub 1. Actually, b is the same for both, so <clears throat> we don't need to make that a sub 1. But anything that varies from problem to problem, it's worthwhile to have uh, a little subscript there. Varies from diagram to diagram within the same problem is what I mean. So that, that will keep track of a sub 1. And then we'd have a separate proportion over here because we have a sub 2, c sub 2, and then I would have little a sub 2, and little a sub 2 is over the sine of 17.74, and then that would be equal still to 49 over sine 58. So the work you show is a fully labeled diagram, and then any use of the law of sines, I just need to see you uh, set up the proportion. If you're solving for a missing angle, you do also need to draw the unit circle and show me the, the two angles that you find. Okay, so you can solve these proportions, and then what you're going to do is check that you get the same answers as what shows up here. This one would be 41.74 and this is 17.61 if rounded to the hundredths place. Lastly, for question number eight, we're going to see how we get one unique angle sometimes. Or sorry, one unique triangle. So we've done problem six shows the case where there are no such triangles that meet these uh, specifications. Question 7 shows that there are two unique triangles that will meet these specifications. And in problem 8, it shows you a scenario where only one triangle could possibly meet these specifications. So let's go ahead and get this information here on the board. Okay, so here and now I've set up the diagrams to correspond with question number 8 that we were just looking at. And we're going to go ahead and start by uh, taking this triangle right here, let's try to figure out what angle C is. So, we know that 69 corresponds with 34 degrees, and then that 58 corresponds to the sine uh, of C1 here. Okay, so you might have just started off with a plain old C because you didn't realize yet that there could be more than one triangle. And you can actually just start off with the acute triangle every single time because two out of three cases you're not going to have an off, a corresponding obtuse triangle. So if you want to just start off with the acute triangle every time uh, and then you can stop if you get to a point where it does not exist or you can continue on to the obtuse triangle if needed, but you could just start off with one triangle and see what happens. Now, when we cross multiply, 
I get that the sine of C is approximately point four seven. Actually, point four seven zero zero before it gets any other numbers. So very conveniently, point four seven is close enough. Okay, so now when I'm looking at the unit circle, point four seven is a low number. So I'm going to have two different dots here, one for the first quadrant and one for the second. Now I'm going to use the inverse sign. and I get 28.04 degrees. I should color coordinate this though. I'm going to use red. 28.04 degrees is the angle right here. Okay. Now, the other angle would be found by subtracting 28.04 from 180. And we get 151.96. Now, if I try to label C2 151.96, Point nine six. This is where I figure out the obtuse triangle doesn't exist. How many degrees can you have total, or do you always have total in a triangle? 180 degrees, and yet I have a 34 degree angle and 151.96 degrees. These two angles alone exceed 180 degrees. So it's at this point we realize that this triangle right here is impossible, does not exist. The obtuse triangle does not exist. So what you do is you just continue on figuring out the rest of the acute triangle. Of course, you figure out A1 by subtracting these two angles from 180, right? And then you end up with side A1, which at this point you can just call, call side A and angle A. You don't need the subscripts anymore because there is only one triangle. So I'll put up the answer so you can finish this problem. As you try it on your own, you should end up with these results right here. Uh, angle C we said was 28.4 degrees and then you should get that angle A is 117.96 and when you sol solve for side A you will get uh, 108.99. And as we already just said, the obtuse one uh, does not exist. So, now, lastly, for questions number 9 and 10, this is us being very slow towards the finish line here. <laughs> or snails. Unless we were turbo, which is that fast snail from that movie. Okay, anyway, back to where I was. Question number 9 has a lovely example video. And so you can go through the example video and it will work it all for you. Basically all you need to do is find the distance across the lake. There is some twists and turns to this problem. First of all, you can't find this side without knowing the opposite angle. Now normally that's not a problem if you have two out of three angles, but you don't. So this is a multi-step problem in that uh, first, I'm giving you an overview anyway, first you need to figure out what angle B is using law of sines. All right, so step one, you're going to find angle B and you use that, the law of sines to find angle B. Once you find angle B using the law of sines, once you find angle B using the law of sines, uh, then you're going to want to find uh, angle C 
and of course you find angle C by subtracting B and A from, one a from 180. So you're going to use the triangle angle sum theorem. Then once you know angle C, then you can find little c, which is going to be the distance across the lake. So little c. Little c is right here. That's little c. So you find big C before you can find little c. So it's just a multi-step process where you have to use the law of sines twice to figure out your value. But you can totally do that. No problem. Okay, and then next, where's my pause button? Am I filming? Sorry about that, I was having tech troubles. Okay, for question number 10, you have a bearing problem. And this bearing problem has a video that accompanies it. So this video right here will walk you through everything that you need to know to do this problem, and it should do it very well. So I also will demonstrate one bearing problem for you, and that is I promise to uh, do the question from the textbook. So go ahead and try that first before you watch the rest of this video and then come back and check your answer against this video. Okay, here's question 35. Distance a ship travels. A ship is sailing due north. Okay, so that's good. Here is my ship traveling due north. At a certain point, the bearing of a lighthouse 12.5 kilometers away is 38.8 degrees east of north. Okay, so here is north, 38.8 degrees. This would be 38.8 degrees east of north. And so then I have a lighthouse. Here's my lighthouse. That looks like a candle on a cake. Anyway, that lighthouse is 12.5 kilometers. From the first sighting, this is the first sighting, okay? Now, as we progress north, this would be later on, the captain notices that the bearing of the lighthouse has become 44 degrees, sorry, 44.2 degrees east of south. So here's south, and if I go east of south, that would be this angle right here, 44.2 degrees east of south. How far did the ship travel between the two observations of the lighthouse? So the distance the ship traveled would be this black line that goes from the first dot to the second dot. That would be the distance. So what we need to do is figure out what this angle is right here. So this angle, very simply, we take 180 degrees, we subtract 38.8 and subtract 44.2 and we get 97 degrees. Now this is when we observe that we do not have a right triangle, therefore we don't use Sokotoa. Instead we use the law of sines. So what we know is this pair right here, 12.5 is to the sine of 44.2 degrees as D is to the sine of 97 degrees. That simple. Cross multiply. So we're going to have 12.5 times the sine of 97 divided by the sine of 44.2. That gives us 17. Point, what are we supposed to round to? Does it say? Uh, well, there's three significant digits. 
So that would be probably the best option if it doesn't say what to round to. Look at the significant digits. So that would be to the tenths place in this particular case, 17.8. Kilometers, not miles. So there you go. That's it. Hopefully, you feel really successful. This again was uh, 7.1 number 35. Uh, the hardest part about this lesson is the ambiguous case, uh, not using the law of signs itself. So I did include on my open math another video for the ambiguous case so that you can hear it explained more than once. I also invite you to read 7.2. 7.2 is going to give you an overview of the ambiguous case in writing and with some demonstrated examples. So if you can hear it three different ways through a video on my open math, through my lecture, and through the textbook, hopefully it will fully sink in and you will understand it no problems. Okay, see you next lecture.